Good afternoon. My name is Savine, and I'm excited to welcome you to the first of three industry sessions as part of the 15th annual Canada's Top 10 Film Festival. We start off with the Irish Canadian Co Production Room, the TIFF 2015 People's Choice Award winner, which has garnered rave reviews and also received multiple Oscar nominations this morning. Johanna Schneller, one of the North America's leading freelance journalists. Yes, please. It was nice reading the news this morning. Um, Johanna Schneller, one of North America's leading freelance journalists specializing in entertainment features, will guide the conversation as we discuss how the world of Room was created and brought to life through the design, production, and marketing with our panelists, which she will introduce. So let me welcome Johanna and our panelists to the stage. You guys want me to call you up one by one? <laughs> uh, the production designer, Ethan Tobman, has worked on lots of different movies, including The F Word, Empire State. He did uh, The Grinder Pilot. He worked with Lady Gaga. Ethan Tobman. The producer, David Gross. Uh, has been uh, producing lots of interesting Canadian productions, including The F Word and Goon. And Adrian Love is the Senior VP of Marketing at Elevation, the Marketing Guru, and uh, he's on the end there. So welcome, everybody. Yeah. Hey, guys. Hi. So Hi. how much jumping up and down was there at 8 o'clock this morning? Was everybody uh, glued <laughs> to the TV You set? don't even want to know. <laughs> uh, we flew yes. in. Yes. I mean, you can tell it, but late last night. But, you know, because it's such an up and down journey. So the director wrote uh, Ethan a long email uh, fretting last night. That, you know, we're not going to get any nominations. It's going to be a disaster tomorrow. So we're sitting there at dinner, and, and it's, it's so difficult to know, right? Because one day we got some nominations. The next day there was a PGA Awards. We got, there was 10 films. We got no nominations. So, you know, it gives you a mood disorder or it makes you bipolar <laughs> if you pay too much mind, you know, to these things. Mm -hmm. So we were, it was, it was, you know, huge this morning. Yeah, I think a lot of the awards stuff up until now maybe let you believe that Emma would probably be a candidate and Brie would probably be a candidate. But I think the Just Lenny, Brie, yeah. Lenny and the picture, the, the fact that the director and best picture is like just enormous. So yay Thank for you, you guys. Yeah. And I, as the moderator of this event, was very relieved because I thought, oh, thank God, everybody will be in a great mood. Yeah. We, we talked about that, too. We talked about that last night. Like, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, it's all great. The room yeah. was great. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. Um, so I guess we'll do this in sort of chronological order about how these things happen. Um, so, Ethan, let's start with you and talk about developing the look of the movie and uh, the kind of work that you, the kind of work that you do when you're developing the look of a movie and how you're... Um, Okay, let's start. Easiest way to start, I think, is to roll this clip, and then we'll have yeah. some jumping yeah, off places so. to start from that. So, <laughs> this is a clip about how it's done. One evening when the sun went down And the jungle fire was burning Down the tracks came a hobo hiking And he said, boys, I'm not turning I guess they still can't hear us. Room is the smallest set many of us have ever worked in, but in many ways our director Lenny Abramson felt it was the largest he'd ever shot. Like a lunar landscape where every crater represented years of captivity, history, and love. Logistically, I designed Room as an inverted Rubik's Cube. There are 300 panels that were removable to allow multiple cameras to shoot from the outside. This both gave our actors an extraordinary intimacy and made it feasible to shoot a movie inside a box. We experimented with animating the sun's trajectory to determine which direction our skylight would need to face. And then this informed us as to which tiles would be bleached versus dark. We developed over 30 colors for the wall tiles. Creatively, I approached designing room by exploring captivity as an abstract concept. 
I started with photos of the Fitzel and Castro houses of actual captives, but then I moved on to tiny apartments in Hong Kong, cages in Bangkok, solitary confinement in American prisons, favelas, and Auschwitz to see how people survive in every inch of tiny spaces. Every object Jack lives with are his friends. Every object has a name, everything has a backstory. And during our rehearsal process, we auditioned the items that made the most sense within the space, given their captor's economy. I felt it was important our exterior shed appear completely innocuous. From the outside, what's extraordinary about room is how unextraordinary it appears. Once we were outside, the challenge in designing room was inverting the idea of captivity. Inside, everything's warm and layered and deeply personal, but outside, materials are cold and impersonal and frightening to Jack. No materials here appeared in room, and this would be deeply confusing to a boy of Jack's limited perspective. Conversely, in designing Ma's bedroom, I wanted to echo some of Room's architecture and set dressing. The dormer windows pick up on the salt box ceiling, the collage on the wall, the louvered closet doors. If you woke up in the middle of the night, you might think you were still in Room. In the rest of the house, we added heavy cold wallpaper and curtains, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, a heavy jail-like banister to close us in, and we always framed boxes within boxes. The idea was that they would feel more in prison now that they're free. That's a very rich little piece of film there. Um, so let's talk just about the physical space. It was built on a platform and then built the actual size with everything removable. <clears throat> right, so you know, Whenever you're starting a film, um, if you're not given a box to think outside of, you don't have interesting <laughs> ideas. Uh, so this is the ultimate box to think outside of. Uh, in design school, you're always told if you're given a blank canvas and no restrictions, you will not come up with some of your best work. Mm -hmm. So what are the restrictions here? You have 70 people on an average film crew. Maybe you can get it down to 40, but not less than that. Uh, you have a child actor who you can only use eight hours a day, but then with schooling, uh, lunch, and bathroom breaks, you're really down to five and a half hours a day. Um, and then you have some of the most emotionally demanding scenes an actor of any age would be asked to do, scene after scene after scene. So the goal here was twofold. One, to have an entirely permeable set where we could effectively work in one of the smallest spaces any of us have ever inherited. and simultaneously to be able to peer into a set without breaking that fourth wall to maintain the intimacy and claustrophobia necessary for everything from performance to lighting. Mm. Um, so from the very beginning, the idea was, let's approach this as an inverted Rubik's Cube where we build it modularly and have the ability to pull out a panel almost as a way of surveillance, mm. to peer in. Mm. Uh, and of course, you know, hair and makeup and lighting would run in and do touch-ups. Uh, sometimes the camera would be down in the bathtub with an operator mm -hmm. inside. But for the most part, the rest of the crew was outside most of the time. And I think that was the trick to providing Lenny and Danny, Bree and Jake with uh, the intimacy and the verisimilitude that space mm -hmm. really required. So they saw the four walls most of the time. All of the time. Yeah. It was very rare for us to pull something out entirely. Um, and the reason the set was built on a platform was similarly to give us the uh, flexibility to shoot under it if right. we needed to. Yeah, there's that one shot of somebody coming up yeah. on the floor. Yeah, it's so interesting. You know, I, I got to interview Brie when she was here at TIFF, and she talked about how even getting to the set, there was sort of a corridor that she had to walk down. Uh -huh. and, and, and in that... The, the feeling of walking down that corridor was, was sort of where she prepared herself for what was going to happen Interesting. when she came into that place. And also that they spent, I gather, some time before you were completely finished building it, so they would, by the end of, right. before they even shot, know every minute of the, right? Is, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, I've actually forgotten this, but Lenny, our director, he, he reminds me of this, that one of the greatest challenges on this movie was getting the set ready two weeks early 
to allow them to live in it and personalize it and familiarize themselves with it so that Jake really could walk around it, you know, barefoot, blindfolded. Yeah. Um, which, as he would 100% be able to do after spending five years in captivity there. Um, he would know every square inch of it intimately. So uh, we were in a race to finish it, and there were times where I did uh, fall asleep there. <laughs> or, or, or in the last weekend before they walked in, I, I, I actually spent... Uh, some time in there alone, trying to figure out what we'd missed or what what that one little thing was that might have been overlooked in all our research. And then one of the last things I added was an enormous piece of real estate for a small set. It's the tree collage um, next to the radiator, which we focus on a lot. And the reason I added it was I, I had received childhood pictures from Jake um, and his family. And I realized if you're a mother with a child and you can't photograph your son, you'll draw him. Hmm. You'll you'll come up with any way of creating a, a, a virtual scrapbook, hmm. as all parents do. And that was missing in there. Hmm. Um, and I remember after I'd spent essentially eight weeks living in that room, I was walking out and Brie was walking in on the first day of shooting. Hmm. And I was sort of shattered and kind of looked at her and she still had a lot of energy. <laughs> we kind of looked at each other like, it's yeah. yours now. Right. After you spend this much time right. in here, I'll see you again later. Um, you know, it's so, the, the, the beautiful description of the, choosing the light, how the light would have gone across the room and building something like that collage. Most of the time the audience isn't gonna see those things. Do you believe as a production designer that they sense them anyway, that there is a kind of verisimilitude or an authenticity or a depth or something that comes from doing all that work? My hope as a, as a storyteller is that they don't notice them. Hmm. That is my hope. I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to distract you. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to envelop and, 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 and help create the dream. You know, in film school we always say um, if you're, if you make a mistake in the process of making a film, you wake the audience up. Hmm. So my goal is to keep you asleep. Hmm. Um, what I do try to do is a benefit to everyone, every technician, every actor, every person on that set, there's something that we've done that's helped make the movie better. It's not entirely of consequence to me whether or not it makes it into the frame or into the cut. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think as a designer, you're, you're best equipped if you don't cry over sets that don't make it. Hmm. And there are many, many scenes that did not make it into room, mm -hmm. and I can no longer remember what they are. Hmm. Does everybody know the story of the toys? That um, the toys were all pretty much handmade by Brie and Jacob. Talk about that a little bit. Sure. Lenny had a terrific idea. We had started one of our funnest projects in the art department on this movie, which was collecting what we felt the um, Ma and Jack would have collected inside room. Discards of groceries uh, and office supplies and very cheap toys uh, old Nick might have left in that room that Ma would have then willed herself to create into toys and landscapes and, uh, and interactive games for a growing boy. Um, and in the process of collecting them and starting to make them, we realized, you know, we on the one hand, we had to dumb ourselves down from the artisans of the art department, and on the other hand, when you have that much time on your hands, uh, you can do some pretty extraordinary things. Hmm. Uh, Lenny saw me doing one of these because I, I sort of became a little obsessive about it myself, no. <laughs> as, as production designers are wont to do, and he said, you know, I have this challenge of creating an intimacy between Jack and Ma, Bree and Jake, in a very short amount of time. And however professional Jake is, he is seven at the time that we start. Lenny is not going to say to him, okay, rehearsal starts at nine, have your lines ready. He needs a way to break the ice. Mm -hmm. And Lenny said, and I had this great book that I bring with me on certain projects called Analyzing Children's Art. Mm. Uh, and we became obsessed with it, uh, particularly children's art done in captivity. And Lenny said, you know, why don't we have them do art together? It'll be a great way to break the ice. They'll communicate together. And if if they work, they'll end up in the sets. And it was a very, very smart idea. Um, they immediately bonded as art can make two people do, ch mm -hmm. children and adults. Mm -hmm. And there was a familiarity when they walked into the room having their work surround them. Mm -hmm. So they had ownership of so the they had ownership objects in the space. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. And they created them together. So they had a relationship instantaneously. Wow, wow. Um, David, let's move on to you. Um, 
talk a little bit about what a, what a co-production means in this day and age. How, how involved is Canada and how, how much did Canada matter here? Um, in this case, we met with uh, Ed and Lenny at TIFF the year the F word was there, which I think was three years ago now. So the agent we had that sold that movie um, was also representing Emma at the time, and she was and Lenny and Ed had just optioned the material. So she said that you know you should really meet these guys, and just randomly I just read the book about a week earlier because everyone had kept recommending it to me. So I thought that was sort of you know fortuitous timing. So we we got together. They obviously it made a lot of sense because Emma is both Irish and Canadian. She's lived here I think for what seven eight years. Um, Lenny, the director, is Irish. So a lot of times, filmmakers in Canada, producers, you know, you try to like forge these unwieldy co-productions that make no sense as co-productions, but you're trying to do that just to unlock certain funding, right, that you might have access to. But um, now that I've done this a few times, I don't, I don't chase that anymore. Like I try to find, if it's not going to happen organically, mm -hmm. then you don't want to do it. I've been down that road. It's, it's too difficult. There's too many. It's too competitive and there's too many challenges that if you're hamstrung with the right, you know, with the wrong elements coming together, it's, it's so competitive, right? It, it's hard enough to get anyone to see any film, mm -hmm. let alone when you're really boxed yourself into something that you know creatively isn't right. Mm -hmm. So this film creatively was right, so I just, I, re I chased them. I went to Sundance, uh, Lenny had a film premiering there. You know, I met with Lenny in Los Angeles a couple times and then I finally hunted them down in Cannes and said, you know, you got to come to Canada. It makes too much sense not to. Um, in which case, we made a deal and they came to Canada. Hmm. And it made a lot of sense for them because they're Irish and um, they wanted to shoot the film in North America. Obviously, it's set here. And Toronto is, or Canada, is the only country that you can do a co-production with that is in North America, hmm. right? Hmm. So Wait, America doesn't... Do well, the, the co whole co-production business is to compete with America. Huh. So, you know, Europe, Mexico, some countries in Asia, India now, have these treaties with one another because otherwise there would be no Canadian film. There would be no Irish film. You know, Canada is, is like Ireland. We're a small country next to a huge country. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why these get done. And in this case, you know, Ethan and I just worked on the F word. So there was lots of synergies with each other. Mm -hmm. and, and luckily we found a kid named Jacob Tremblay who happened to be from Vancouver as well. Mm -hmm. So it just, you know, really came together seamlessly. And Tom. Tom and Tom, Camps. yeah, he's great, right? I just love him so much in the movie. Have you, how many of you here have had a chance to see the movie? Lots of people, yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully. you go see the movie now. Yeah, now, <laughs> now, you'll, now you'll definitely yeah. want to go see it. Um, <coughs> I, when uh, they were all here, Lenny told a great story about wooing Emma by writing her yeah. a letter where he basically said, here are the reasons that I want to be the director because he knew the book was very popular and there'd be a lot of demand, lots of people would want to make it into a film. And uh, then he said, and here are all the other things that people are going to say to you that are going to try to seduce you and here's why they're wrong. So he did a preemptive strike as to, you know, like, don't fall for any of this stuff. Did you pull any of that? Were you able to sort of say why it should be you and no one else? Um, I don't know if I had any competition, at least from Canada. I was the only one sort of flying across the world chasing mm -hmm. them. So Were other countries after it? Um, well, I mean, maybe, but it didn't make sense, right? Because to go shoot in Belgium or, mm -hmm. or shoot in London, it didn't really make sense for mm -hmm. the film. So, and they weren't being wooed by the Americans? Of course they were, yes. But they wanted to keep, <laughs> I mean, Emma and Lenny wanted to keep their independence. That was the most important thing for them. And you give up a lot of independence. If you sell your movie to Fox Searchlight, you're going to have 12 executives sending you notes every day mm -hmm. and watching the dailies. So I think more than anything, that's what they didn't want. So this is the best way to keep your independence is really to use the system and use you know the resources that Ireland had. We had Film Four as an investor, which is a free TV network in the UK, and we had Telefilm Canada and the OMDC. So you can use all of that, all those resources, instead of you know a big uh, MG from Fox Searchlight, as an mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Are you saying what the budget was? Sure, it was uh, 13 million. 13 million, so geez, you can get a lot done for 13 million if you do it carefully. Um, we have a clip, right, that's uh, w one of the... Um... Maybe it was from, was it your clip? It probably might be my clip. Well, no, I think there was... Uh, there I'm was... happy to talk about it, whatever the clip is. Okay, there, there, there's a clip that's associated with <laughs> okay. you here, so we'll see. 
I will not talk about that. <laughs> Every once in a while, a film comes along that makes you appreciate the beauty of life. The most amazing performance I have ever seen. It changed me, as all good movies should. I don't know how to do it justice. There is no place I would rather be. Bloom is now nominated for three Golden Globe Awards, including Best Picture, Best Actress, and Best Screenplay. You're gonna love it. What? To the world. This movie is amazing. A cinematic masterpiece. Room is the best movie of the year. Room. Okay, well that could go for either one of you, but we'll stick <laughs> right. with you for a second. Um, <laughs> was there something in particular, like how did they respond to, and how did you decide on Toronto and what were some of the, you know, the pros and cons of shooting um, here? Well, I'm born and bred in Toronto, and we, we just shot the F word here. Um, you know, we have a crew here that we always work with. We have lots of people we trust. So we just brought them to Toronto. We said, here's all the people we like to work with, including Ethan. Mm -hmm. and, and they were happy with, with everything, so it was a very simple decision. We didn't really give them another option. It's pretty funny because what I loved about the F word was that it was so Toronto. It was like, this is a movie set in Toronto yeah. about Toronto. And this would then be the opposite. This is sort of any city, right? Yeah, very much like the book. Mm -hmm. The book was set in any city USA, and we wanted it to have that same feel. It wasn't about which city. You know, we didn't want to, because it was sort of a, a fairy tale, you know, it, there was, it was about more than, a, it wasn't a true crime tale, I guess. And so that specificity probably would have worked against us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And is, um, I guess I want to say, do movies like this redound well onto Canada? Like, can, can, is this now a calling card that you can say this is the kind of co-production that we're able to do? Is this something that you hope to use hope to so. generate I more and more? I haven't tried that yet, but, <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully, it, you know, it, it was successful, obviously. It, it, um, it worked. The film is, is fantastic, so we're all proud of it. Um, I think it exists as a film, and I think it exists as it's fantastic for Toronto. I think everything about, you know, Canada's in a good place right now. We really nurtured this industry for a long time, and we put a lot of money into it. And TIFF, you know, I wasn't around back then. I wasn't attending the festival, but 20 years ago, it was a little festival in Yorkville. Mm -hmm. And now everyone in the world shows up here every September, and they know Toronto, right? Toronto's now a big global city. And we have first class crews and we have Suicide Squad, two hundred and fifty million dollar movie shooting here. So we have the best vendors and we have great artists. So all of this collectively and a low Canadian dollar, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you know, do wonders for the film industry here. Yeah. So it's great. It's mm -hmm. funny, you know, a lot of these stories are stories of like pain, how hard it was, how hard it was to come together. This one seems kind of like the opposite of that. This one seems like one yeah, of those I, ones Yeah, I would that... like to tell you that we overcame like spectacular adversity to get here today. <laughs> <laughs> and in most cases, I do, you know, in most films we've produced. Um, but this one had something special about it mm -hmm. and with... It came together, we had a lot of support. I guess what was special about it was Emma wrote a book that sold millions of copies before we, you know, we started. So when we went to Cannes um, with the film, we had multiple offers for every territory. So it was, you know, it was the opposite problem. We had almost, you know, too much, hmm. too many resources. Hmm. There's no such thing as too many resources, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but An embarrassment of riches. Compared to what we're used to, we certainly did. Yeah. yeah. I've been saying for the longest time, where is the mid-level drama? Like, where is the mid-budget, adult-oriented drama, the Kramer versus Kramer? It's on of television. This? Yeah. yeah it's and on and television. I feel like here, yay, we have one. And when you get one, people are interested and, and want to go and see it. What do you think the resistance is? Why do you think everybody thinks it has to all be like, a two dollar movie or a 250 million dollar movie it's just the economics of the business are, are such that you have the tent poles sucking up all the theaters the exhibitors are giving them we were talking about earlier there's an art house theater in los angeles called the arc light and they're an art house theater for the most part and eight of their 12 screens were star wars over christmas so there's no room there's no room for these films mm -hmm. speaking of room mm -hmm. um, but, um it's I, and I think it's the Netflix of it all. A lot of these films end up on television now. Hmm. So you can make a $2 million horror film, you know, put it out for a weekend, make some money, and, and hmm. be out of theaters in a week. But films like this used to last, like some of the films here. We, th they could play for 12 weeks, and sometimes they wouldn't find an audience for eight weeks. And then mm -hmm. I think it's what's happening with Room. It's a slow burn. Mm -hmm. We've been out now for 10 weeks maybe. And just now, people are finally starting mm -hmm. to come up to me mm -hmm. and even know what the film is. 
Will you get more screens now with these four Oscar nominations? Yeah, you can, you can ask I the hope, guy to my hope, left, hope but we expect to get more <laughs> screens. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, this is a good transition to you then, <laughs> yeah. uh, Adrian. Um, let's talk a little bit about it, because I, I was saying to these guys earlier, you know, I've, I've been banging the drum for this movie ever since I saw it at TIFF, but there are so many people who say to me, oh, well, I, didn't, I couldn't bring myself to go, or it just seems so hard to take, and oh, is it going to bother me? Am I going to be haunted by it? Like, ah. But then after they go, they go, oh, my God, that was great. So how do you get people from, like, ah, to yay? Well, I think, I think it's... Uh... It, it, there's several steps there, because, but the, the first thing I've got to say is that this is like one of the best challenges a distributor can have when you have a movie this good. Uh -huh. Like there's different ways that as, as distribution you run into challenges, but when the production does such a phenomenal job and you watch the movie and you know how powerful it is, you're already kind of trying to come up with ways on how to kind of convince an audience. And we saw, I think we should start by showing that first trailer. Sure. I think what's interesting about the first trailer and what we sh saw right after right now was the last TV spot that we've kind of aired. Now mm -hmm. there'll be new TV spots because of this morning, which is fantastic news. Mm -hmm. But kind of to show, the, I was going to talk about the transition, about how at the end there, you didn't even see the room in that TV spot. Like that last spot we just saw mm. was kind of critics quotes and kind of the only line of dialogue from the movie was, and it's also going to end the teaser trailer that we started with, is you're going to love it, the world, mm. which mm -hmm. has kind of became like an anchor point for our campaign about what this movie's actually about. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's an interesting kind of, when you see what the teaser trailer, before anyone had seen, like no one had seen the movie, it was about to play Telluride in Toronto, and we wanted to use that press to kind of show the world, like we're going to release the movie no matter what happens, so to show people what the movie was, mm -hmm. uh, we released this. Which okay, I think well, this is the first one then. The first so one. Imagine going backwards. Yeah, going backwards. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. One evening when the sun went down and the jungle fire was burning, down the tracks came a hobo hiking. And he said, Boys, I'm not turning. I'm headed for a land that's far away. <laughs> I guess they still can't hear us. Do you remember how Alice wasn't always in Wonderland? She fell down, down, down deep in a hole. Right, well, I wasn't always in room. <gasps> I'm like Alice. Now we've got a chance. I'm scared. I know. Truck. Truck. Wiggle out. Wiggle out. Jump. Jump. Run. Run. <laughs> Goosebumps. Um, so I wanted to ask you, just in terms of the arc of that, it has a real story in it. Mm -hmm. Were you concerned about revealing that they get out? Well, I think that's one of the key things. You ask about how it's harrowing when, like, initially, I'm working with A24 distributed in the, U the, the U.S. distributor as well. It's a, the same campaign. Uh, we work closely with them. It's kind of, you needed to tell people right away, this is not a would they, won't they. This isn't, like, you're not going to spend an hour and a half in a room. Mm -hmm. It's the story is about as much the story is about, or even more, but what happens when they're out of the room as it is about the room. And the room is kind of more the setup for, to tell the true narrative of the movie. Um, similarly with the, as I said, that kind of anchor kind of line from the movie of the you're going to love it, the world, the idea that it's not about uh, wallowing in what happened in that room. It's about kind of seeing the world through these brand new eyes. Um, and that, and the beauty of the world, and so trying to kind of change the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's 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 hard is that people did resist. Like in the, you know, in the in, when we first showed this, people were saying that we were giving away, the, we we're giving away a huge plot point. But I thought we felt that it was the only, it's the only way we could kind of convince people this isn't 
you, you're not going to get trapped right. in a movie. Yes. I mean, I think we've all been fighting against, we still are today, it's the girl in the dungeon movie. If you, yeah. if you distill what the movie people think it is, like you're saying, mm -hmm. that's what we have to get over, that it's not the girl in the dungeon movie. <laughs> you know, like, that's been done before, and this yeah. isn't that movie. Yeah. And we saw such interesting things, like even like, so then, of course, the movie plays, and we, at the Toronto Film Festival, we win the People's Choice Award, it's fantastic. We do these test screenings and people are loving the movie. It's like we're feeling this great response from everyone who sees the movie. But even when we start talking to people, even when our press, the press that love the movie, or champions of the movie start talking about it, they're starting to use words like harrowing or hard, like in their description of the movie. And for, I don't know, I've seen the movie a whole bunch of times, probably not as much as these guys, but you kind of, you feel, when you watch it, that's not the emotion you feel throughout mm -hmm. at the end of that movie. Like, mm -hmm. you, I, I get, so we kind of, you're trying to figure out how do you shape a conversation and how do you start to communicate that this is actually about a mother's love and then a, a child, like a, the child's love for, its, for her, his mother as much as it's about what's happened to them and how and I think the love knows no boundaries is a great to kind of tag to kind of say that this is, this movie is about kind of overcoming odds mm -hmm. rather than facing them. And so, like, I think Room is such a fascinating test, cu test case for, like, research screenings, because we did get these well above average scores, like, we're in the 90s and, like, kind of the norms in the 70s, but then you'd run into this question called definite recommend, which is kind of, do, would you tell your friends to go see the movie? And they were kind of still above norm, but not anywhere close mm. to the way mm. that the people liked the movie, and especially our demo who liked the movie the best was women 25 plus, and they were the ones that would recommend it the least. So you got into this weird situation where you're trying to kind of mm -hmm. figure out how to tell people, no, that it's a safe place, and mm -hmm. kind of, and that it's not exactly as how you describe it. Even running into synopsis became a problem, because as people, because when you're having a dinner party conversation, like when we release movies like this, one of the things I always kind of talk about is how we want people at dinner parties to kind of you get the look of shame of like you haven't seen this movie yet so you can't you can't like participate in this conversation and the, but the question's always what is that movie about and as soon as you say oh it's a woman who's in captivity who's had a child like everything else you say just seems to kind of <laughs> not matter it's like they focus mm -hmm. on that yeah. and Lenny and the production team did such a great job of not showing kind of like what's in people's mind of what this movie's gonna show is far worse than what this movie of ever shows. Like even yeah. those that have read the book, I don't know if you've spoken <laughs> to your friends who've read the book, a lot of people who love the book, so, uh, I, you know, at least I can put the book down, but yeah. in, a, in yeah. a theater, I can't put it down. Yeah. I feel like it's too, you know. I had this really interesting experience of when I read the book, because it's the book is told through Jack's point of view, um, I felt his voice much more keenly in the room parts, and I was less connected to the part when he got back into the world. And watching the movie, the world is a whole other, we didn't even get to talk about the production design of the world, but the, but the you know, um, I was much more interested in the world part. And I think that that's yeah. a real and, success and that's of the it, film. And also the different art forms, right? Because mm -hmm. that's something you can do in cinema that you can't do on the page, and, and the internal monologue is something you can do on the page that you can't do in right. cinema. That's right. So just seeing the physical size, just seeing how far he'd have to look down a horizon, all yeah. of that really was very yeah, impactful. Yeah, I mean, we've seen the film a hundred times, and I, the point I still cry at is when he sees, you know, when, the, when he gets out of the carpet and he looks up at the sky mm -hmm. for the very first time in his life, and that's an incredible moment. Yeah. And, and I remember, like, you know, I knew it was going to happen in the book. I knew we were halfway through the movie, that it couldn't be over yet. But I was still immensely involved in the suspense of him getting out of that truck and finding somebody. And, like, it's amazing what you can pull off, even if you think you know the story. And I think, I think, these, I think the production team did a great job of reinterpreting, because the book, you come so from uh, Jake's perspective that you're kind of, you don't really get how much he's leaning on Ma. You don't get the struck, like, I think the movie's structure so interesting that like he's the Ma is the support for the whole first half of the story and then he becomes the support for the second half of the story which is something that isn't like you don't get through the book mm. it's just something that you can't do as you, as you said right. from that first person narrative structure um, we're going to cut to your questions in a couple of minutes but I want to ask you just first Adrian do you always approach um, marketing campaigns through the emotional telling of the story or is that unusual for this movie uh, I think well, I think as you as you can see, our because we ended up having to like at the end we end up leaning on critics. Like you end up, I think you approach marketing campaigns with the idea of who are you trying to who are you trying to get into the movie and how are you going to get them there. And when you start a campaign, it's 
it's hard because you don't really have the feedback. And we started with the emotional part of the story because consciously we didn't want it to be seen as a thriller. We didn't want like this to be seen as Gone Girl or something. We wanted to mm -hmm. kind of have show that this movie was a, an emotional movie. Mm -hmm. um, and you didn't have an avalanche. And we didn't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but by <laughs> but by the end but by the end of it we we kind of. <laughs> By the end of it, we did turn it into kind of, it's almost, and it's uh, like it, now with the Academy Award nominations, I can't wait to if have If they the cry, they buy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if they cry, they buy, exactly. Mm -hmm. That was what we were talking about at the beginning. And now it's going to be, well, people want to check out their ballot, check off their ballots, and now the conversation's going to be, you've got, you must see this movie. Right. Because the know, critics have said. I just want to add to your point, why don't we see more middle budget dramas, which, by the way, is the reason I got into this business, those were the movies that were playing uh, that made me want to see these movies. The reason is because not enough people go to see them. Yeah. <laughs> so here's, here's a place yeah. where uh, intelligent, uh, well-reviewed, and now well-recognized uh, cinema <coughs> can be seen in a movie theater instead of on TV. And if it isn't, it, it, it speaks volumes to the industry at large about future Productions like this that need the justification of success. So it's all on you. No, <laughs> not to feel any pressure or anything <laughs> like that. Um, so I guess we should raise the lights, right? <coughs> and the way it's going to work is that um, we have people in the aisles with microphones, and if you have a question, raise your hand and they'll give you a mic, and then they'll let me know that you have the mic. And uh, please don't be shy. There's one up on the left aisle there. Okay, but then I'll remember that you're next. Hey, Hello? You, you can stand up or you don't have to, whatever. No, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, quick question, actually, regarding the marketing campaign, um, I'm always interested in adaptations, uh, which is a, an easy exercise, but actually one of the most uh, difficult <coughs> exercises. And Excuse me. in terms of marketing, I wonder if you took into consideration the readers that had read the book, because um, as an audience, it's sometimes one of the most difficult audience as well, because they have all these expectations, they don't want to be deceived, et cetera, et cetera. I was wondering how you worked with that. Thank you. Well, we definitely, even in the teaser campaign, we used from the best-selling author, a best-selling novel, and as David said, I think even when we acquired the movie, it was very, like, we knew that, like, this book was, uh, was already kind of a sensation. The great news, the great thing about this movie was that Emma also wrote the screenplay. So we, there really was, we felt from the very beginning that there wouldn't be that kind of frustration that sometimes book readers have about the adaptation because we knew that Emma <coughs> was going to be kind of front and center through this. And, we, and from having even read the screenplay, we knew that she'd really captured the magic of what made that book. So I think this is a very unique case because, because of Emma writing the screenplay as well as writing the book. But I think in general, we kind of try and... Anything that kind of, when you're trying to introduce, especially like a mid-level drama like this, you're trying to introduce do something to an audience when you don't have that much, you know, the marketing budgets of some of these bigger movies, you like to point to something familiar, something that they can kind of go to, lean on, and work with the, uh, work with published, like people like Indigo to help us promote the movie as well. Hi. Uh, is this on? Oh, there we go. Uh, thanks very much for this. It's been really fascinating. Um, I'll just preface it quickly by saying that I have not yet seen, but I'm very excited to see the film. So if this question uh, seems off, that's why. Um, talking about the production design, I love the idea that it's so an all-encompassing and enveloping and that you were using it to help the actors sort of find their place in the film. Uh, and then we're talking also about the, uh, the the power of the music in the trailer. Was there ever sound or music played on set that the actors were responding to? We, um, it's funny, I, I actually forgot about this. We had a mix that we made, Bree and I made, and I think we played it for Jake too, but the truth was Lenny is, he's such a thoughtful filmmaker and he's so patient. Um, I think it's one of his greatest virtues as a filmmaker is he doesn't rush to decisions, he doesn't have preordained choices, but he's always making his movie. So on the one hand, he's open to <coughs> everyone's ideas. On the other hand, he will choose what's right for his vision. And he kept himself open throughout production. He said routinely that he, the music could go either way. It could be orchestral, 
and sort of um, consumptive, or it could be in incredibly minimal, and, and, and it, it could be human chanting, it could be synthesizer, uh, it could be organic. Um, and he ended up going the grand route of a, of a full orchestra, but it was by no means what he, um, what he thought he might do while we were shooting. But what Brie did and what made it into the movie was that song, um, Big Rock Candy Mountain, songs like that, folky songs from the 30s and 40s that maybe our, our grandparents or parents might have sung to us when we were going to sleep, that was something that was on set quite a bit, especially for Jake. Hi. Hi. <clears throat> I'm curious about the casting of Brie. Um, so given that it comes from such a popular, or stems from such a popular book, I could sort of see it going in, in either direction in terms of when you thought about casting that role and did you think about casting a star? Uh, like Brie is a great actress and she's been in great indie movies, but she, prior to this Oscar nomination really, hasn't been like a household name or that well known. So I wonder if you were going purposefully for someone who was a bit more under the radar or if you did consider bigger stars and how you thought through um, that process. In, in this case, because we had the IP, we had a book that had sold millions of copies. We were less concerned and we had less pressure from the distributors to try to cast the biggest uh, name that we could, and usually that's what they want. But I know Lenny met with Emma Stone. Um, who else did he Shailene. Know? Shailene Woodley. Um, Rooney. Rooney. So he met with all sort of the hottest actresses right now, and he really thought, you know, Brie was the right choice. And, and she was... You know, if you're in sort of inside the beltway, sort of everybody did think she was about to break. So if she wasn't going to break in room, someone else would have cast her and she would have broken, you know, broken out in another film. So she was on the cusp and which we liked. And so, I, you know, I don't know. It's always you're always balancing all these different things when you make these decisions. But obviously it worked out in our favor, I think so. I also, if I can jump in on that, she <clears throat> at TIFF told me that um, she and Lenny had big, long conversations yeah. about kind of the mythology of it and the Plato's cave story and all kinds of things. In, in, in she sort of understood the story on a really um, on a multi-layered kind of way, and I think that that also really appealed to, to Lenny. And and the fact that when she acts, she's so simple, mm -hmm. and I think that that those kinds of things really combine to win him over. And he seems like a guy who really. Um, needs to be emotionally involved in what he's making, right? Is that fair to say? Definitely. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, guys. I'm going to ask a total AD, AD nerd question for a second. Um, how many days, I'm curious, did you shoot? And I've had some experience working with leads under 12, but never seven and never as many days. Uh, just curious if, if there was any challenge keeping him totally engaged and interested because I've I've seen that fascination of this process is amazing they're terrific and it's the point where they kind of get over it, it's kind of boring <laughs> they see the same faces every day and keeping them engaged were there any challenges like that for Lenny or any of you guys <laughs> no challenge at all <laughs> <laughs> not the hardest thing Lenny's ever done in his life uh, if Lenny were here he would say they always tell you not to cast children dogs yeah, or animals what's the other one? Uh, well, Children and animals. Children and animals. And, you know, we have a dog <laughs> throughout the entire second half of the film and a seven-year-old in every scene. Um, the, I think one of the smartest things Lenny was insistent on from the very beginning was shooting in chronological order. Um, especially in room, but whenever possible outside it. So we started in room, and when we left room, we left room. Um, I think for any actor taking those scenes out of order would be challenging. For a seven-year-old, it would be abusive, impossible. Yeah, it would have been impossible. Um, and so Jake grew while he was in room. Um, and uh, in terms of entertaining him, <laughs> Lenny was uh, so patient and so extraordinary uh, at explaining bits of the story in bite-sized nuggets of, of truth that Jake could consume and interpret. And he had a phenomenal agent to that with Brie, because Brie was in the room with him so much. And Brie 
I, I mean, in some ways, it was the most extraordinary thing to watch because Brie is so such a consummate performer. She can stay in the role, and Jake will deviate and come back, and Brie will pick up right where she needed to be, and sometimes will whisper to him or, or brush the hair out of his eye uh, to, to make it a usable take. So uh, the two of them conspired together a lot, and, and they were it was essential. I mean, I, I know Lenny has said one of the things he was looking for when casting an actress was someone he knew he could use to help get that performance out of a little boy. And how do your part of your question was how long? Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. for forty five days. Yeah. Four, I think we shot for forty five 45 days, days, but we only shot eight hours a day because, yeah. Seven. Yeah. yeah. Seven. Yeah. <laughs> During the school year, yeah, we started. Uh, we started in early October, ended mid December. Yeah. There was a question. Does somebody have the mic in the back? Yeah. This is just a producing question. Uh, you talked about chasing down Lenny and flying everywhere. I, I wonder if there was also a story behind what you called the IP, the rights to the book. Was that also your chase? Is there somebody who had done that before you came on board? How were the rights acquired? Um, well, the story that we already told was Lenny met with, um, with Emma. Emma controlled the rights. She was the author. Many people in studios were chasing her down for these rights. Lenny's from Ireland. She's originally from Ireland. He wrote her a long 10-page impassioned letter. And they sat down, and they both had the same you know, feelings about the material. Neither of them wanted to you know, assign it over to someone else who, who might con control or interfere with the process. So, um, so at that point, they had already partnered. Emma had already partnered with Lenny. And so it was really just about convincing them that, you know, that we were good partners for the two of them. Question here, thanks. Can you hear me? There we go. Um, it's just picking up on the last question, I was curious about the adaptation process and the writer, and if that was something that existed when you came on, or if that was something that evolved um, from the novel to the screenplay, in terms of the, you know, you talk about the two different art forms. And I'm curious about that evolution for the writer, because I don't know much about her. Um, it, you know, what was challenging for her that she anticipated, and, and then maybe what she didn't. I'm kind of curious right. about that stuff. I, I, I think Emma told us, right, that she started writing the screenplay for this, like, when she finished the book. Mm -hmm. Just speculatively, she's like, I feel like this would make a great movie, so I'm going to write a screenplay. Um, so by the time Lenny started talking to her, she had some very rough, it was probably a 200-page screenplay. Um, but again, she had never written uh, a screenplay before for film, and it had a lot of these issues that we talked about where it was too much from the internal monologue of Jack and things that you can't really you know, uh, dramatize on, on the stage or in a film. So I think Lenny w and, and her, once they got together, I mean, you know, we probably did 10 drafts of the screenplay, but it was really Lenny um, steering that, uh, his vision for the film. She trusted him. So he was able to sort of bring that experience um, of how he makes films and how he wanted those. You know, everything evolves. Every time you cast someone, you know, you, we cast Brie, and, and Lenny's like, well, now that I know who the actress is, maybe some of these lines don't work anymore, or some of these characteristics aren't right for Brie. So you're, you're constantly, even while we're shooting, we're constantly, you know, it's a, of course, yeah. it's a, it's a never-ending process until you lock picture. And didn't they say at uh, at TIFF at the press conference that Lenny sort of flew in and sat at her kitchen table and they would actually, you know, sort of, yeah. she, he, uh, Emma made a joke that uh, Lenny's, um, she would know that she had gone to the wrong place when Lenny would say, to TV. <laughs> to TV was the sort of you know most vicious criticism he would give her, but they worked it out. <laughs> Who else? Anybody else back there? Yes. Hi. Um, I was just wondering. I noticed at least four American actors in the film, and I'm just wondering how you structured that in a treaty co-production. Like, did some of them have dual passports or? EU passports, or how did you? Um, what was your casting strategy to make all the points work? That's a good question. 
<laughs> I'm trying well, to think. Well, me. who's? Uh, it's Joan. Joan. You have Bree Bill. and Joan. Bree. There's William three. William H Macy is he not? Yeah, there's yeah. three. There's yeah, Bill. Bill, Sean Bill Macy. No, he's Canadian. Sean Bridgers. Oh, okay. Jacob's Canadian. Tom's Canadian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you can have two non-treaty actors maybe in a in a cameo. So okay. I think Bill was the cameo. Okay, I thought Sean was American as well. No, he's Canadian. So you're saying you followed the rules, is of what you're I saying did. here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anybody else have one at the moment? No? Adrian, I'm going to throw one, one at you there. You, you said that in this, um, the trailer that you used the critics. I'm curious. So critics, that does still factor in. Like there is a place still for uh, critics, oh, right? I, I, absolutely. And I think that there's Did just... you see your quote? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that like we... we I expect to see my quote. <laughs> we, yeah. we, we look at a lot of quotes. Like we, we, and we had such great quotes to way to communicate, to balance exactly everything we were saying. Like we had to pick the critics. We had to pick quotes that changed the narrative from this movie being harrowing and dark to being something uplifting. Like I think some of the ones, like the key ones that weren't in there, we had like two of the best hours of the year, mm -hmm. which is such a great quote. We had uh, one of the best movies of the decade. Mm -hmm. Like the, you kind of, and I think that there's still, and this movie, I think this movie less than some, than some other movies we've worked on that are kind of even harder than this movie. Because I think the, 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 real ish, the real story of this movie is that it's not hard, but it just kind of people's minds made it hard. But when you do, when you do have a very, tough, challenging movie, which uh, there still is a place for, I think sometimes you need critics to tell people that, say, okay, you got to take your medicine and be ready to, th like, th you need to see this movie because it's important to see it. And I think this movie is important to see, but it's also part of what, what's interesting to me about marketing this movie and the, the challenges of this movie is that I think when people, if you, if you talk to people leaving the theater, None of them would say the movie was hard. It was only in the way they were describing it afterwards. And mm -hmm. I think if this was like 10 years ago, they used to do something on TV spots called testimonials, where they literally they would mm -hmm. interview people as they left the theater. That's become completely, like people don't trust that anymore, I think. They think it's too picked through. And mm -hmm. then also our joke that we made was that they'd just be to everyone would would be crying. Print, they'd be crying too much. <laughs> they wouldn't want to have their. They wouldn't sign off on their images. It'd be a pretty <laughs> funny montage, though, of like grown men. Yeah, we, we we had some crazy ideas that we would do for this movie. Like we talked about doing a night vision shoot, like the horror movie, but having everyone just crying as opposed to, <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to being scared. That's hilarious. I want to see those. I want to see those campaigns in action. Now I want to ask: Is there one more question out here? Anybody? <laughs> I'll ask you one last question, then I'll let you guys go. You three are all, you know, professionals, you're businessmen, you've been doing this for a long time. This movie seems to have gotten under your skins in a way. Is that is that fair to say? Does this do certain ones feel different or are there certain ones you sort of get more behind? Can we just go down the row and talk about that a little bit? Oh yeah. Um it's funny, I Bree Bree's been talking about this a lot lately and uh and, and we were talking about it yesterday. Um, <laughs> when you do interviews for some movies, y you know it's like it, it's annoying. You're already on another project. Uh, you you have to be on, and uh, and and you just sort of like do it and then go back to work. And with this one, um, two things. One, when you give an interview about Room, every journalist, every person who's seen it, every family member that reaches out to you, they're so moved by it, or they're so. Uh, curious for comfort that you end the interview and go to sleep. You're just like <laughs> wiped out. Exhausted. <laughs> and then the other thing is, you know, we, we all cared so much about the responsibility of getting this right and it meant so much to us and it was such a finely calibrated target we had to hit. We knew it. Um, and we've now been doing press for it for so long. Bree was saying recently, you know, when all this press is done, it's like room is just gonna be gone. And we've been living in some form of it for a year now. Yeah. And, uh, and we were talking about last night, it could have been gone today, right? If we had no right. nominations yeah. today, then yeah. it's over. Yes, we, we, we could have been your last event, but yeah. no, but no. <laughs> right. No, but at, at some point we've, we've all become a family because we've been doing yeah. these panels and these awards yeah. brunch and all this different stuff yeah. for six months since yeah. TIFF. I've never felt tighter with a group yeah, so, of hmm. people in this so, business before. It's definitely. David, do you feel more emotional about this than and others? Goon, for example. <laughs> <laughs> goon, um, goon probably made you cry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. This was this was a labor of love in many respects, and I'm sure it's in ten years from now it'll all look back 
especially fondly on this on this one. Mm. And Adrian, there are there different you know ones you really want to get behind. Absolutely, I think you kind of when you see something so special as like when we saw it the first time, and you know, and like, and working with it, and that really trying to figure out how to kind of crack that like how to get people to see it, knowing that they're going to like it's going to be a transformative experience as opposed to something you know convincing somebody to see something that they probably aren't going to remember in a couple, in a couple of hours, uh, is a very different experience. And I think just b going along for the ride with kind of, you know, everyone on the team and with A24, as we got through, like, TIFF and kind of our fingers were crossed that, you know, could possibly maybe win the People's Choice Award and then kind of going all the way up until this morning, as you said, the jumping up and down in our office, as we kind of had that moment of, like, is the ride over? Are we going to be able to keep on kind of having people keep on having our Facebook feed filled with people who find this movie and love it. Like, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very positive, it's just a very positive experience at the office and for, for me personally, absolutely. Well, it's great to talk to you all about it. The care that you gave to it is evident when you watch it, and that's really a pleasure. And uh, have fun in the next six weeks. Like, Thank you very much. See you all jumping up and down on the 28th. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thanks for having us. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And thank you all for coming. It was yeah, great to have you. so many people here to talk about it with. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Thank you guys for coming and sharing such great insight. And congratulations again on the nominations. I'm sure we'll still be talking about the film for a lot longer than six weeks. But, you know, as the release comes out, home video, online. Um, if And thanks to you guys. If you're joining us for the genre panel next, please take a break. Grab some popcorn outside and come back for 4 p.m. And if you've... Have time? Check out the Samsung Lounge outside as well. I'll see you later. <laughs>